This podcast is supported by Netflix, presenting the extraordinary new film from award-winning director J.A. Bayona, Society of the Snow, Spain's official submission for Best International Feature Film at the 96 Academy Awards. Society of the Snow tells the inspiring and harrowing true story of the rugby team who survived 72 days in the Andes Mountains following a devastating plane crash and the humanity that survived. One of the best films of the year, says Collider, and a remarkable achievement, says Next Best Picture. The expert craftsmanship brings the harsh and complex environments to life with rich and immersive sound, hyper-realistic visual effects, and an emotional score from Academy Award winner Michael Giacchino. Society of the Snow, in select theaters December 22nd and on Netflix January 4th. Welcome to Screen Talk. I'm Ann Thompson. I'm sitting in a very professional podcast booth at the offices that I I want to say it's PMC, basically. Yeah, it's PMC. It's it's Variety, the Hollywood Reporter. And this microphone makes me want to do Hello, this is Ann Thompson, the Nightbird. I used to do a jazz show in college. Ryan Latanzio is sitting opposite me in person, and um, we're going to do the podcast live uh, across from each other yes, today. Yes, being in here is a reminder we are in a professional organization. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> And we're kind of high coming off of uh, IndieWire Honors last night. Uh, Wednesday night was IndieWire Honors. And we uh, gave awards to um, a lot of people, Todd Haynes, uh, and it's sort of a career achievement award, a visionary award. We gave uh, a number of awards to, to people, uh, including Greta Gerwig who was really sweet and said that she remembered me interviewing her back earlier in her career, which made me happy. And she also um, said she struggles with how we sometimes do letter grades on our reviews because she's someone who really wants to get really good grades, (laughs) (laughs) which I found very amusing. That's an endearing. And and it was just really, it was really fun, you know, to to have my daughter meet Greta Gerwig or to hang out with Ben Safdie, who also got an award for for The Curse along with Nathan Fielder. They were very funny and very caustic. But when I was talking with Benny, he was talking about Oppenheimer. And I was, when I saw Oppenheimer for the second time, I was struck at how much screen time his character got, this supporting scientist. And, and I wanted to know whose idea it was to wear the sun mask at the uh, the big bl- bomb blast, and it was op- it was Christopher it Nolan's was, idea. It was, uh, and you you haven't watched their show really, The Curse. I saw you, the first episode. You kind of jumped off of it. I sort of did, yeah. yeah it was I, a little cringy for me. Well, it's it's daring you to walk away from it, and uh, and I did, and you did, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I think Nathan Fielder figured that out. He was he, I was telling him I found it cringy, and he was. He didn't want to hear that. And I said, isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you're asking us to feel? He didn't go there. He, well, he's very sincere. But but on camera and on stage, even, you know, whether on Jimmy Kimmel or accepting an award, you know, he has this sort of brash, discomforting persona. Definitely. But he doesn't want that. You know, he doesn't obviously he doesn't want you to only be reacting to that uh, in the series. Clearly, you know. clearly. Um, so it, it's been a lively week. We have um, the Spirit Award nominations to go over. Um, it was expected, a lot of the nominations, but May, December, and Past Lives did really well, along with American Fiction. They all got five nominations apiece, and um, all of us strangers did well, too with four, and including some key uh, acting uh, slots. Um, the Spirit Awards are interesting because they're not uh, the same as the Oscars, but they could overlap a bit uh, because they're industry people voting. A lot of overlap with the voters. It's not just young indie folks. There's a lot of craft people, especially on these nominations. Yeah, and it's not all necessarily below or above the line kind of people. It's it's the industry at all levels. Um, what's interesting about this next year's is that it's going to be 
two weeks before the Oscars, and you, which you know, usually people come out to LA and they make a week of it, and now, well, they're gonna have to make two weeks of it. You know, there were a couple of obviously destined to never go to the Oscars um, Spirit Award nominees that I wanted to highlight that I also <laughs> was really excited about. You know, Eileen did pretty well at the Spirit Awards, and it has not done well at any. And I know you despise this movie, um, but it got two acting. It left me cold. It got two, well, I think that it's supposed to a little bit, right? It uh, doesn't. Eileen isn't one that's going to go to the Oscars, but no. I would say that the the support for the holdovers is is coming from a lot of places. Like the National Board of Review, they went pretty hard for it. Uh, exactly. Best film, best actor, best supporting actress. I mean, who who is the National Board of Review exactly? That's it's an older the one crowd. Where a they're very New York, and b they're very. Um, I would say, given that they, um, for example, they gave best film to Killers of the Flower Moon, best director Martin Scorsese, best actress Lily Gladstone. So we can't deny that Killers of the Flower Moon is continuing to do very well. It, it was too big a budget for, for the spirits. Very much so. <laughs> yeah, like but, um, seven times the budget. <laughs> but but luckily, um, some people um, – um, but, but the holdovers is also there, as you point out, and poor things finally cropped up at the National Board of Review. I was, I'm, I was getting a little worried. Me too. And uh, and that was another one that was too big a budget for the spirits. Um, and, Mark, and Mark Ruffalo feels like someone that will repeat at the Oscars, maybe not necessarily winning. You know, interestingly about poor things is that the Manola Dargis New York Times review dropped today and- She eviscerated she Pretty it. much. I mean, she said it really, she feels like it's really self-satisfied and it doesn't really invite you in for that reason. You know, I wonder- why can a movie be self-satisfied? Why is that necessarily a problem? She didn't quite, however, a much, um, I would say, considerably less influential critic was someone who completely excoriated it was Mick LaSalle in the San Francisco Chronicle. I checked because, you know, I go on Metacritic and I saw that the rating had dropped. I mean, it's still 87, but it was That's like in the high, it was still, in the though. mid 90s. Yeah. Poor Things coming out of the festival was just, everyone just raved about it. And I, a lot of people expect it to do really well at the Oscars, especially with the crafts, but also Emma Stone, very competitive, and and also Mark Ruffalo. I think he's competitive with Robert Downey Jr. and and Ryan Gosling. So it's good to see these names coming up. It, it, it hasn't opened yet, and when it does, it will do well in theaters, I believe. And I think that that will help poor things. It'll give it a lot more momentum going forward. Yeah, no, this is one where, you know, my my non-industry friends that don't follow this, you know, what we do as closely, Poor Things is really one that's been on everyone's radar and one that they're excited about. And, you know, because a lot of people love Yorgos Lanthimos. I mean, he's, he's becoming a sort of art household name. Absolutely. But what I was going to say about um, the National Board is that they are quirky and uh, not really predictive. Um, you, you can't assume that just all these these I mean it doesn't hurt Killers of the Flower Moon to be getting all these nominations and, and awards, but it isn't necessarily predictive yet. It is only when we get to the Globes and the Guilds that you're really in the in the zone. That's right. That's right. It's not it's not the critics groups. They I don't call the NBR a critics group either, by the way. But um, it was nice to see Tiana Taylor get a breakthrough performance. She did yeah, okay on the spirit absolutely, side, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's um, a really, you know, we've touted that movie on the podcast several times. But it's so good. It's great. And she's really amazing in it and totally against the type that you kind of understand her. And having been in these Tyler Perry movies. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's, I don't know if that will go to the Oscars, though. So American Fiction is also doing well, and it's good to see that they actually um, gave Sterling K. Brown a supporting nomination at the Spirits, which, I mean, which is, um, yeah, I did. I just interviewed him. And Davine, you know, is up there, too. You know, it, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens when, when we get to the actual winners. But um, Anatomy of a Fall continues to present uh, at these places, uh, at the Spirits. Um, Zone of Interest is among the international nominees. It wasn't um, something that AFI was able to do. So AFI is the other uh, top 10, which is actually more predictive because it is a group of people 
that is a there's some academics and some critics in there, but a lot of industry people are on the jury for for the AFI top ten. Here are the films: American Fiction. This could be the top ten at the Oscars. Is my point. Um, I'll tell you the one I think won't translate, but you can you can guess. Yeah, well, it's always interesting on this list to see which one is not here, and often they. They do give a special award to an international movie like they've done with Roma in the past. Um, similar movies to that, but that did not. No, that happen didn't happen. I guess, yeah. and I guess poor things actually qualified, uh, even though it seems to be British to me. But anyway, American Fiction, Barbie, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, May December, Oppenheimer, Past Lives. Poor things. And the one that won't make it, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Much as I love it, it's going to stay in its little corner of animated feature, I'm afraid, because there's so many actors in the Academy who don't support animated films for Best Picture. So Sundance is, um, the, the whole Sundance lineup came down. And um, what are some of the ones that struck you, Ryan, as things that you would you know, run to see? Yeah, you know, so I was sort of combing through the lineup today, as I like to do. You know, it's a lot of documentaries this year. It's a really nonfiction rich uh, platform, which really makes sense because the market is really lusting for nonfiction storytelling at the moment. But I, I picked out some genre projects that I'm really excited about. One in the world cinema dramatic is called Handling the Dead, and it's directed by Taya Vistendal, and it's written by the author of Let the Right One In, oh. and he also is a screenwriter, and it's another horror movie. Um, this time it's about, um, it's set in, um, I believe, Oslo. It's all Norwegian, and it's about um, uh, thousands of people who've recently died all come back to life, and it's so, sort of like how society deals with this in real-world terms. But what's interesting about this one is that it is, what I'm most excited about is that it's a worst person in the world reunion because it is Renata Rensfa and Andres Danielson lie back together again. Fantastic. And that is one of my favorite well, movie couples out. of all time. I did not, I did, that one did not pop out at me. So there are a couple that are produced by big people. In other words, Darren Aronofsky is producing something called Little Death, which is directed by a guy named Jack Beeger that no one's ever heard of. But uh, the word is that that one is worth, uh, checking out that he'll be a, a talent not to not to miss there's a Sundance lab grad uh, named Sean Wong who did a movie called Didi that people are are, are, are kind of uh, hot to see um, Soderbergh is there Steven Soderbergh with his self-financed presence written by David Kappa who he often works with and it's 35 years since Sex Lies and Videotape, and he's Won the back. Grand Jury Prize, and yeah. he's gonna he's he's gonna sell the sell the movie there. Um, one of the movies that sold is is the Zellner Brothers movie that went to Bleecker. Sunset Sask Sasquatch. Right. So um, I'm not always a, a huge fan of the Zellner Brothers. They're, they're hit or miss with me. I'll see. I'll see. I'll check it out. And I'm very excited to see Freaky Tales from uh, Ryan Fleck and Anna Bowden, uh, starring Pedro Pascal. And, and for them, a really a return to sort of personal filmmaking after their last movie was Captain Marvel. And we all know how we feel about that here. Um, and, you know, remember, these are the directors of Half Nelson and Mississippi Grind. OK, so a couple other ones I'm looking forward to. There's one that's been kind of hanging out for a while that uh, is finally landing, which is uh, Love Lies Bleeding, which is the next film from St. Maud director uh, Rose Glass. Um, and St. Maud's a movie, a 824 horror movie that everyone, you know. She's British? Threw their She's British, yeah. And this is a lesbian romance set in the world of bodybuilding, but the fact that it's in the midnight lineup obviously tells us there's going to be an element of genre. So or this is Kristen Stewart, right? That's right. Yeah. So she has a second film, which is from the Zuccaro brothers. Love Me. Called Love Me. With Stephen Yoon. Yeah. I'm looking for that one. And uh, there are a lot of good docs. The Girl State sequel to Boys State from Amanda McBain and Jesse Moss. And they're good. They're good filmmakers. Um, Yancey Ford's Power, which is about policing, which I think could be good. And then there's some uh, bio docs. Uh, Frida from Carla Gutierrez. She's a well-known editor who's directing for the first time. And Don Porter does a Luther Vandross biopic. 
There is a Rory Kennedy docuseries that seems like something that will definitely get picked up called The Synanon Fix, which is about a cult that started as a drug rehab program and then turned into something much more violent and dangerous. And I will, of course, see this because I will watch every cult. I've seen every cult docuseries that's out there, including this HBO one that everyone's talking about called Love Has Won. But I'll save that discussion for, for another time. So people say uh, that visual artist uh, Titus Kaphar has a movie that we should definitely check out called Exhibiting Forgiveness. And this is one of the ones that has like this long list of star producers Stephanie behind Yellen, it. Stephanie Yellen, Derek C. in France. And um, Jamie Patrick Hoff. And that stars Andre Holland, uh, who's a terrific actor. There's a movie from the UK called The Outrun from uh, Nora Fingscheidt uh, starring Sir Ronan. Um, it's an addiction story. And that's looking for uh, a distributor. And then Chiwetel Ejiofor is directing his a movie called Rob Peace, and he's in it as well. And you, re you recently spoke to the programmers at Sundance, and some of these were titles that they were they, the ones they who were tipped hot me. On. Yeah. Right, right. So that's, that's where all this information comes from. So that's a lot uh, to to look forward to. It's a very strong program, I think. No, it is. And I mean, and also one thing to know about it this year is that there is a different, a reduced virtual opportunity for those at home, but they'll still be able to see select titles, including from the, the competition section. So what they told me, all the competition, uh, world, US, doc, narrative, all of them, there are 10 in each of those categories, are, are, are available to the public. After the press and industry gets a crack at it after six days, and then everybody else gets uh, a crack at it after seven. And it's, it's a, a situation where they recognized that making the in-person uh, experience was incredibly important, uh, making it a priority. And, and everybody gets to look at these movies later, that's all, if, if, uh, if they choose the digital option. Anyone who's competitive about wanting to get there first is going to want to see, you know, be there in person in order to be at the Eccles or wherever, the library, and get to see these things before everybody else. Otherwise, you're sort of waiting at home, looking at the, at the reviews and twiddling your thumbs until you get a crack at them. But I enjoyed doing it on my sofa last year. Well, I mean, I went for a week last year and then, you know, waited in lines and all these things. And then I got home and there was everything just there on the platform for me. <laughs> and I think they recognize that it's expensive to go to Sundance. And I think they're recognizing a lot of people will go for the first week and then they'll go home and, and catch up from there, from their sofa. Uh, which is, oh, one of the 10 best lists we didn't do. John Waters, always my favorite. Uh, yes, I mean, he always zigs where others zag. And of course, he chose Bo is Afraid, the Ari Aster film. Perfect for him. his favorite movie, The Mirror. Uh, I love that movie as well. And that would certainly be on my list, uh, which we will be sharing those. We're going to do that next week. Next week. We're going to do our top tens. So, you know, there are some idiosyncratic titles on here. Some of them don't have US, U.S. distribution that I'm not familiar with. One I was really happy to see was Master Gardener, which I caught up with not too long Paul ago. Paul Schrader. And, you know, that's sort of, at the end of his sort of like man in a room trilogy that he does. But it's much, even though it's dealing with like heavy themes around racism and May, December romance, uh, it actually is one of his more uh, touching and gentle films. It's and a beautiful film. It really is. It is a beautiful film. Um, what I loved, his, his quote for Bo is Afraid, he compares it to um, – it's a mad, 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 mad world, right? And he says, it's a laugh riot from hell that you'll never forget, even if you want to. <laughs> and my other great quote, for uh, my other favorite quote is, he also puts Oppenheimer. Good for him. He puts Oppenheimer on here. I always, I'll never forget, John Waters, when I worked at Film Comment, I got him to do his guilty pleasures for us. And one of his, you know, he, he gave us all art films, like, Wild Strawberries by Ingmar Bergman. That was his guilty pleasure. Um, so he says about Oppenheimer, it deserves the Oscar for being a big budget, star studded, intelligent action movie about talking. Which it very much is. And it's not, it's unusual to see a movie of Oppenheimer's stature on one of these John Waters lists. Uh, you know, one I think I've talked about in the podcast before. Happy to see this cat. Of course, he would love this movie, this Catherine Brea movie last summer about a French lawyer who uh, represents abused minors who then has a 
sexual relationship with her underage stepson, underage by American standards, not by French standards. How old? He's 17. Uh. So I think in France that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to check on that. And then there's another film on here by the uh, Austrian troublemaker Ulrich Seidel. This movie, Sparta, that's about a pedophile that will never get U.S. distribution. I haven't seen it, but he tends to be a very provocative director, and I think this movie actually has gotten into him in some trouble, and so, of course, that would appeal to to our, our friend John Waters. Indeed, indeed. He's he's so, he's just, he's one of my favorites. He's, 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 he's funny. Um, okay, we have coming up uh, one of our live interviews, and we t we talked to Ryan and I. We spoke to the uh, the guys who opened this production company called T Street, and they are the filmmaker Ryan Johnson and his producing partner since Brick, since the very beginning, two thousand five, um, Ron Bergman, and they explained to us what what they're doing. Two of the movies that they made this year. From first-time filmmakers, one was Chloe DeMont, Fair Play, which sold for $20 million at Sundance and went to Netflix. The other was American Fiction, which is swiftly climbing in the Oscar race. So they didn't do half bad off the starting line. So it's a fun, it's a fun interview. I first met Ryan Johnson and Ron Bergman at Sundance 2005 with their first movie, Brick, which I loved. And you know them from Brothers Bloom and Looper and Star Wars, The Last Jedi, and of course, the, the Knives Out movies. They have continued to pursue uh, this extraordinary uh, kind of filmmaking that is not like anything else. And that's why uh, I think it's cool that they've started a production company, T Street. And welcome. Welcome. We're going to dig into what you're up to. Hey, Anne. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having us. So for you here. named T Street after a road in San Clemente. Is that is that right? It's a road. It's a beach, really. It's the beach that I in San Clemente would spend my summers at. And um, yeah, we were kind of kicking around ideas for names and kind of the whole point of the company was to create a nice place that felt good to be at. <laughs> so it's kind of, and when I thought of that, I thought of summers at T street. Um, but that kind of is the guiding like light of kind of what we wanted to do. We wanted to make a place for people that, that we like to come and make stuff in an environment that, uh, you know, sets them up to su succeed, I guess, but also just feels like a, a nice day at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> so why is Rom like your perfect producing partner? Why why are you two linked at the hip in this extraordinary way? I mean, I uh I'll, I'll make him sweat here a little bit. I, I'm gonna I'm compliment I'm gonna him. Be, I'm gonna be. <laughs> I mean, Rom is the reason that I'm still doing this for I'm still able to make movies. I feel like Rom, first of all, it to find somebody who uh, you can completely trust and who is as good at their job as a producer as Ram is and really on every level from navigating the business as a whole to the nuts and bolts of how the sausage is made with putting together an actual shoot and the logistics of that. Um, the fact that I found a true partner who prioritizes the creative, what's important about making a great movie and um, and I know I can trust, I guess it comes down to trust, you know? And so we've just formed this partnership and um, I really, it's its the luckiest thing that ever happened to me connecting with this with this guy right here. You know, <laughs> you know really the, the lucky motherfucker is me, not him, right? So we all know that, but uh, I'm the lucky one. So I wanted to talk about the, um, what's obviously the formative movie for you two that Anne mentioned, which was Brick, which really, when you look at it, is kind of the rare, it's really a shoestring budget under 500,000 um, Sundance sensation that went on to make back 10 times its budget at the box office, theatrically, of course, this is 2005, mm -hmm. and with a completely original story and screenplay. And so I wondered, like, is there a movie in the last few years that you feel like could be this generation's brick? Or is it like, is it possible for a movie like that to exist and break out anymore in the current paradigm? I'd be curious to hear Rom's answer, answer this. I feel like it... it and that's 
kind of the incredible thing about Sundance is that even now I feel like we're still all looking to, I know I'm like, it's been years since I've actually been able to go to the festival, but I'm refreshing Twitter, looking for the reactions coming out of screenings at Sundance. Cause I know there's always going to be at least a couple of movies that are the ones that we're talking about that year and that are on my list of things to see. So, um, and typically they still tend to be, you know, original films, uh, and, uh, very often come out of left field, the ones that take everyone by surprise. I feel like, uh, so in that way, yeah, I mean, I, Ram, you can speak more of the business element. I know it was a very different time and a very different business model when we were, when Brick came out, but creatively, I feel like it still has that pulse. I mean, I don't, again, the business has changed, but I still think if you make something that's original, it's good and somewhat accessible, th there will be a distributor as an empire to buy the movie. More than ever, I think this is, with all the glut of stuff out there, that's the way to really survive and that's the way to succeed is doing that, whether on a smaller level or on a higher level, but you know, aspire to do that kind of stuff. Well, that's where T Street seems to come in. Um, you st why did you guys uh, start this company and what, what are Valence Media and MRC doing with it? And what is the difference between the T Street that makes Knives Out and the T Street that is the incubator for young talent? You know, when we started this thing, we said, like Ryan said earlier, let's just make, you know, we've got a little bit, we know how the business works. We've been doing it for a while. Why don't we start a company where we can produce other people's stuff, people that we find are cool, that can make cool stuff and good people? That was really the thesis. Like, we don't want to spend time on, you know, we only want to spend, time is the, the only currency that's important. It's not even about money. It's like, time is so important. Let's find cool people, support them, you know, see if we can make the movie. So at some point, we, when we started it, you know, we had a partnership with MRC uh, where they funded and we had the first look uh, with them on film and TV. We don't have it anymore, but we have, really those people became really very close with us and we've made all those movies together with them and it's predominantly on the film side jonathan goffman and brian adler and they've been really a true partners uh, on those movies yeah the whole thing was especially with the incubator that you're talking about it was we know what it took for ryan and for myself to go from brick to where we are and the goal is why can't we do it with other filmmakers? Let's find predominantly first-time filmmakers, support them, help them build a team of producers as well. So to create like a team of a producer and director and be there through the entire process from beginning to an end. And hopefully if it worked out, maybe we can continue and that team of producer and director can continue going to make other movies. And since we have been around for a long time, we can help them not just in the process of making the movie and selling the movie and releasing the movie, but also can help them in their trajectory, in their, you know, help them how to strategize whatever their next move should be. So that was it. You know, it was not about, yeah, it's not about any, the business was not, let's, how can we monetize it? It was just, let's support filmmakers and producers. I had a question for you guys, just stepping back a little bit. I'm always curious with producers, like how do you describe your job as a producer to someone who's not in the industry? Because producers kind of do all things. Or they and, do nothing. Or they do nothing. <laughs> and so, and because they do all things, or nothing they get they can get taken for granted uh, i'll uh, before ram answers i'll just say ram is kind of I mean, every producer is different and ram is definitely very unique in terms of at least my partnership with him as a producer and in terms of him being a little bit like dick van dyke and mary poppins the one man band with everything <laughs> attached to him but also a true partner not just on movies like movie to movie but a true partner over the course of of a career which I don't think a lot of filmmakers uh, are lucky enough to have, but that's that's partially reflected in the philosophy Ram talks about at the company of even on a project basement basis, assigning a producer to a project that's there from the very start to the very finish. That's kind of a microcosm of 
what Ram and I have had in this bigger picture partnership that um, that's been so useful. But I want to hear Ram's definition of producer. I want to hear this. I, I, I listen. I don't know. Everyone is different. Everyone is operating different. All I know is you have to be there from the first moment that anything starts until the last thing until the last moment after the movie came out and even after that right and you have to be involved in every part uh, on everything that's that's the only thing i know and that's kind of what we are trying to get to filmmakers that and try to get the filmmakers and the producers to know that this is their job they need to be there from the first day to the last day you find out many producers they're just involved in the producing some are just in the development some just come in here and there and our whole thing here you have to be there from day one to the last day and even after that thinking ahead for the next movie or whatever the strategic and yeah to me you have to be involved everywhere but again there's other producers a who don't want to or no interest and they're doing really well it's really like uh that's the only way i know and that's the only way so hopefully what we're getting here with the, our producers that are based in the company. I was just going to say, and I've got kind of read, this is something I've kind of realized in watching over the past few years, how Rom has kind of uh, guided the company. I've realized as important as it is to find filmmaking voices as important as big a thing, but less kind of in the spotlight is that Rom is training producers and Rom is um, taking the producers at the company and really, um, and we have some really experienced, really good producers, but we also have they're they're he's kind of showing them how how he does it. And so as much as it's bringing filmmakers up, it's also kind of showing producers this method of of working with filmmakers that's worked for us. And are you becoming a producer, too? I get to be the cool uncle. <laughs> 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 no, I give all the producing credit. I mean, there are, that's the thing is like the and and uh, my priority is still kind of doing my own stuff. And so I, I really, for me, it's an opportunity to watch other filmmakers work and to learn from that and to kind of uh, learn by watching our producers put these things together and get them over the finish line. But um, I really just get to do the fun part. And what is it that you don't want to do with T Street? What is it that you're avoiding? I, I think we're not in the business of volume or we don't need to feed you know, other companies need to feed the pipeline because there are a certain amount of people. So they have to make movies and they have to make money. We're in a unique position that it's not our, it's, we are not motivated by that. We just want to make work with good people and try to do something different, right? Every time, right? Because I truly believe that this is the only way you're going to cut through. So, and since time is the, as we getting all there, time becomes more important. You really just want to spend it with people that you think it's worth spending your time with. And we believe that if you do it for the right reasons, success comes, right? Not you doing it for the wrong reason. So it, I think that's kind of what happened to us. We Everything we've done, we've done because we wanted to do those things and Ryan wanted to make those movies and we just did them for the right reason. And if they work, they work. And if they don't, they don't. It's okay. As long as we enjoy the process, that's the most important part. Well, T Street has two high profile movies this fall that are in the awards conversation, which is Fair Play and uh, American Fiction, which is coming out soon. And these are both first time feature filmmakers, uh, Chloe Dumont and Cord Jefferson. So I'm wondering, using these as examples of the kind of talent incubation that we're talking about, you know, is there is there a leap of faith that you're taking with a first time feature filmmaker or in the case of Jefferson and, and Dumont, do you kind of know immediately like this is a vision that we want to pursue? I think, first of all, you take leap of faith with any filmmaker or with any person you partner with, whether it's their 20th movie or the first one. You just you're taking leap of faith of them and they're taking leap of faith on you. Right. So no matter what, there is leap of faith. And as far as first time filmmakers, yes, but it's also so much more it's so much more exciting and rewarding if it works. But also, I mean, we the common factor with Chloe and, and with Cord is these movies, you know, these movies take take big swings in di very different ways for both of them. But, you know, there's a very massive possibility with both of them. They they we would put them together and they wouldn't have worked. Their audiences wouldn't have responded to them. And that's 
that's fine because our motivation from the start, the thing that we were really putting our chips down on is here's a filmmaker with a voice that knows what they want to do. And this is something crazy that, or not crazy, but this is something that's really swinging for the fences and uh, it kind of starts there. It's true of both of those movies. And I mean, <laughs> you sold Fair Play for $20 million to Netflix <laughs> out of Sundance. So you you hit a home run right away. And then it was a huge hit on the service, right? And um, I love that movie. I, I interviewed Chloe. She's great. Um, I can't wait to see what she does next. And then and then American Fiction, too. I mean, it wins the People's Choice Award at, at Toronto, which is, of course, a bellwether for, for the Oscars. And you can see how it's growing, how it's building um, over 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 time. How did you support those films? What did you do to make them turn out so well? I'm beginning to I, I can't help but think that T Street helped them to turn out as well as they did. First of all, we got to give credit to, again, the people here in the company, which Ben Leclerc, Nico Scaramidges, and Leopold Hughes, who are producing those movies. And they have been there from day one. And again, also to the guys at MRC, Brian, Jonathan. But yeah, our job is to support those guys. It's their first movie, but they knew what they wanted. We just, you know, it's our, our job as a producer. Again, the same thing you would treat, I think, somebody who directed 10 films, you know, we've been there, so we know where things, you know, to troubleshoot and kind of see what things are coming your way that they maybe don't see and how to support them and how to guide them at every stage of the process, whether it's in post-production, whether it's when you're hiring people, when you cast it, or even when you're going and releasing the movie and premiering the movie in a festival. You know, we've all done this for so many times, so... We like kind of know what works and what doesn't work. So our job is just to guide them, you know. One big uh, move was making uh, Domont go to Serbia. Is that right? To shoot yeah. Fair Play set in New York City. We were doing Glass Onion. Uh, we are doing Glass Onion. After Greece, we went to Belgrade in Serbia where we're doing our stage work. And when we decided we we're going to make the movie and realized that the budget was too high for what we wanted to make the movie and to shoot it in New York was not realistic. And also A, it was gonna cost a lot more money and B, you were gonna have to find locations. I think I said to Chloe, you're gonna come to Belgrade, you're gonna get more days, we're gonna be able to build the sets and it's gonna give you, you're gonna be able to play with the camera. You, it's gonna be significantly better for you. And we can make it for a price and then you can go to New York to shoot the exteriors and she was game. And I think, you know, you have two big sets in that in that movie, whether the apartment and the, and the office, and we've built it and to exactly the specification that you wanted. And it made a big difference compared to if we were shooting in a tiny apartment or a tiny office in New York. Troll. I mean, that, that's something that Rom kind of when I was trying to get brick made, because I was trying to get that movie made all through my 20s and failing. And I had done the thing everyone tells you to do. I gave it to a line producer friend who said it's going to cost $3 million. And so I was looking for $3 million. And it was Rom who said, this is a weird script. This is a, you have a very distinct vision for it. The only way this is going to work is if you can make it with and maintain control over it. And the way to do that is to make it for as little as as possible make it for a price which is all to say that that's i think if i look at uh, a key to success that kind of we that this whole process tries to give to these filmmakers it's giving them support and giving them feedback and giving them uh control setting them up to succeed and setting them up to get that vision you know up on the screen you know, one thing I wanted to say about Fair Play is that uh, it, it kind of rode into Sundance um, with a, a low key profile. I remember it was kind of on my radar because I remember like Karina Longworth tweeted about it and was like, bias aside, this movie is really great and has like an Adrian Lyne kind of vibe. And I was at the very, the I guess you would call it the world premiere, the first screening that was at the library at Sundance. And the energy in that room was just like really crazy. I mean, it's just it was one of my most memorable movie going experiences of the year and i was writing the review and it was like as soon as it ended i was like i have to run back right now and i have to do this one immediately so so the this is this is the thing i always keep telling filmmakers or the reps or publicists 
people tend when they go to festivals, they turn to hi- hype, overhype movies. Festival brain, yes. And, that's and what I we call have it. always had this strategy from break until now to exactly do the opposite. Mm. Don't talk about the movie. Don't hype movies. Don't set them because the moment you're overhyping, you're setting it to fail almost. Like right. just if you believe in the movie, let the movie play. And if it works, it will develop in an organic way. People will hopefully discover the movie. That's always been our strategy. And, you know, so that was the case on the Fair Play. Specifically, we, want, we wanted to make sure it's not on any list on anything. We said we knew that we thought the movie was good. And we said, let people discover it, see what happens. Very, very smart. So between uh, Fair Play and American Fiction is a movie called Snack Shack from yeah. Adam Carter yeah. Ramir. I confess, I've never heard of, I know, who is this guy? He is a very talented filmmaker. And uh, hopefully you'll see the movie at some point in the spring next year. It's really, it's a lot of fun. It's kind of a coming of age coming of age film you know while we're kind of on the the groove of talking about uh your the rest of your slate um you know i, I have to ask uh, where you are perhaps on if you can what you can say on the third knives out you know netflix bought two more films for like a huge amount of money so you know you're of course you're going to be delivering a third and obviously you both have a great deal of experience in franchises but with like with glass onion you, you it's almost like a spin-off where you kept the central mythology of the first movie but it can exist on its own and so i wonder if you're approaching the third film with a similar kind of ethos yeah that's i mean that's what's ex- that's the whole reason i was excited about making more than one of these is the idea that it they could be like like agatha christie who, who wrote you know thousands of books but each one of them there's a completely different reason for that book to exist and uh she messed around with trying different genres which we each one of her book within the whodunit frame and different tones and um different themes and and that's that I think that's the only thing that I can get excited about with making a new movie is if it feels scary because it's something I haven't tried before. And this third one is definitely that. It's it's very different than Glass Onion, which is also very different from Knives Out. It's it's definitely its own animal and uh, more to so come. So you're you're in the middle of writing it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm 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 working away. When you when you wave your phone around just now, like you did the, oh, no, the phone, it's... it's a notebook. Notebook. It's a notebook. Yeah. <laughs> so in there are 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 the notes that you're making. There's and here's the script. Yeah, yeah. I was about to flash flash a page at you, but I'm afraid someone would freeze it. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't really to decipher it anyway. It's really just like I mean, horrible and like ink blots and like yeah. It's <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and, and I can barely read my own handwriting, but, but yeah, I write in, I've written in these little notebooks forever and, um, I outline forever and then start, you know, writing longhand the scenes and then I start typing and, um, you know, it's, it's writing, man. (laughs) I don't know. It must've been hard to be made not to write for a while. I wonder if your brain like took long walks and wrote in your head, you know? You can't stop thinking about it. In that way, that's kind of how I write anyway. I think about it forever and kind of get the whole thing together in my head. And then, uh, but it it was definitely, I mean, I, amongst many people were breathing a big sigh of relief when we could go. I never thought I would be looking forward to writing. And <laughs> that was when the strike ended. There's a series that's coming out next year, uh, a Netflix series, uh, The Three Body Problem, which is based on like a hugely popular uh, book that I know a lot of my friends have read. And and this is from uh, Benny Off and Weiss, the, the Game of Thrones guys. And they've They've sort of jettisoned the George R. R. Martin world. But I wondered, like, when you're kind of stepping into business with these guys, you know, what's their mindset? Do they do they want Tabula Rasa, like a total fresh start after Game of Thrones? Or are they using tools from that world to kind of build this one and approach it similarly? I mean, I've I've been friends with Dan and David for years and years. And and that's the big reason that we were excited. when And I we had kind of um, engaged with these books that I was just a incredible fan of and the notion of finding somebody 
crazy enough to try and adapt them was <laughs> was exciting to me. And then when Dan and David were up for it, I mean, for them, I I like I can't really speak for them, but I I think they were just excited about the material. I think for them, um, it wasn't so much about uh, contrasting it to Game of Thrones or something. It was that it, it, you know they hadn't felt this kind of oh my god if we can get this right this is going to uh blow people away um which they also had felt when they first read game of thrones and decided to jump into it so i think that's that's the connection between the two i have been trying to get david benioff to do a movie adaptation of city of thieves oh my god it's a great book (laughs) Every time I see him, I bug him and give him a hard time. Keep so you got to bug him too. You got to make him do it. I'll open up a second front. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you guys have been great. Thank you so much for doing this. It was fun, as I knew it would be. Just looking at Ram always makes me smile. I, I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, Thanks, guys. I appreciate Thank you. it. Appreciate it. Bye.